Let's all just lift our hands up and close our eyes real quick as we pray. Lord, we just thank you, God, as we come into your presence. Holy Spirit, we're here. Thank you for already being here. As we worship you, God, you've come into this building. We just praise you, Lord, ahead of time for what you're about to do. As you take over this atmosphere, God, we just thank you. Thank you that you would be honored, God, by everything we say, everything we do. Jesus, I'm praising you, Lord, that this is your moment and your time that you would be glorified through this amazing testimony. Thank you for the people you've already released. Thank you for people who are still seeking freedom, that they'll find it totally today. God, you said we do not forget all of these benefits. You who heal all our diseases. You who restore all of our weaknesses in our souls. Jesus, we thank you for the benefit of freedom. Bring freedom in this house. Freedom to every person who's still bound. God, if there be new people here who have never been here, let them feel like they're in the family they've always been looking for. Jesus, that this would become their home from this night on. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. In my hand, you can all be seated. Thank you so much. Awesome, awesome. So, my name is Gavin. Do we have any visitors here tonight? People who are here for the first time? Would you just wave your hand if you're visiting us? I see some people, thank God. Yeah, welcome, y'all. Welcome, everybody. Awesome. Uh, so, my name is Gavin Tate, and I'm here as a part of the staff here at The Way. It's been amazing. My wife is Ashley. She's down here. We moved uh, from Georgia, the other side of the feels like the earth, but just the United States, <laughs> and came to California. So, uh, but I'm up here with an amazing woman. Who are you? Hey. <laughs> well, my name is Christy Fembrez, and I am the blessed wife of Pastor Armando Fembrez. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So we're starting right away, and Christy came out with me tonight just right away because her story is so powerful. Obviously, every person's story is so powerful that's been shared during this entire series. Um, and this will be our last message that's on this series about forgiveness, and I'm calling it the untangling. And you'll see as we move on in the story and let the testimony really preach for itself that not every single person, when they get saved, just everything goes away that they're struggling with. There are incredible, amazing stories. I know people who get saved and that same time, alcoholism's broken. They never want drugs again. They, all the perversion's gone. Their minds are clean. Amazing miracles. But for so many people, it's a process of untangling one thing at a time, one lie, one false belief. One time when they were seven years old and this happened, when they were 12 years old and this happened. And what the Holy Ghost does, because he is the great counselor, can I just ask you a question? Do you know how great of a counselor you have? Come on. You see, when you, when you go to counseling, not at this church, praise God, but at many places, you're going to pay a fortune to talk to somebody who's got issues just like you do. Well. Now, here's the deal. Does God use counselors? Absolutely. Miss Christie's an incredible testimony of that. But you have the greatest counselor. He's been around since before time ever began. He's helped people through every situation. He's helped people overcome every obstacle. And he has counsel for you. The Bible says in Proverbs 20 verse 5, that wisdom or counsel is in the heart of every man or woman. And a man or woman of understanding knows how to draw it out. So in other words, the problem that people have is first they don't recognize that every answer they need is actually closer than they think. It's right here. But they don't know how to draw the answer from this place to this place. So the Holy Ghost shows us how to actually draw the counsel and wisdom. All the answers you need are actually already inside of you because the answer giver is living in your temple, which is your body. For many of y'all, you had demons living in that body, but now you got the Holy Ghost living in the body. 
For many of y'all, you had all kinds of issues with that body, but Jesus is restoring that a piece at a time. So as we go into this, we're going to let the the testimony speak for itself. I'm going to be asking Chrissy some questions, and we're just going to unfold her story. There's a lot packed in here, so we'll keep it going, but we're also going to be preaching a sermon as we do the testimony. So she's going to be helping me out. We're going to both be giving insights. We pray you're going to be blessed. So Miss Christy, as we begin, let's begin right from the beginning, okay? So overall, the condition, how would you describe your childhood? Describe your family. All right. My family overall, um, dysfunctional, like literally um, the definition. Uh, We had extreme poverty. We had extreme abuse, outbursts of anger, um, you know, physical abuse, sexual abuse, verbal abuse. And uh, there was a lot of confusion, I would say. I don't want to jump into that too much. Uh, We grew up in church, but there was a lot of, I'll just say confusion for now. We're going to unpack that later. Um, Instability. A lot of moving, um, a lot of isolation. I'm the oldest um, in my household of 10, but I have half siblings I never met. And um, just a lot of insecurity about what are we going to eat, where are we going to live, um, what's going to happen tomorrow, um, what, what are the parents' moods going to be in. Um, just a lot of fear and, and abuse and poverty. How many times you had said that you had moved? How many times before, when you were in elementary school, how many houses did you move to? Well, I, I said I probably cannot count. Um, in the moving, there was a lot of homelessness in between. So sometimes we went camping for a few months. Um, I remember starting kindergarten <laughs> um, from a trailer park, you know, at like a like traveler's world type of place where you're supposed right. to just go for vacation. Um, and so I had five elementary schools. Um, two middle schools, and you know, um, I always say I stayed in high school only because I moved out. But numerous, numerous movings, and yeah. most of it was because we were being evicted. So if anybody isn't familiar with that process, they don't let you know. You're, I mean, you get a 30-day eviction, but it's just kind of like my parents would just wait until the sheriff shows up and bangs on the door, and you have like 30 minutes to get a trash bag and get your stuff together and run out the house. And that was like childhood. Yeah, and when you talk about extremely poor, obviously living on welfare for a lot of that. Mm-hmm. That was what happened. Now, in the house, actually, you said yeah. nine grew up in the same house. Yeah. And how many were in each bedroom, for instance? Oh, easy, four or five. Sometimes, um, I remember sometimes when we lived in trailer parks, you know, like those um, awning rooms they zip mm-hmm. on? She would, my mom would put a, like a sofa bed out there, and we'd sleep on the sofa bed outside, and my parents were inside the trailer. Golly, so, yeah. and you were talking about the atmosphere of your home. And you said it felt very, two words that you said were micromanaged and controlled environment. So even though you're in the same rooms, there was something that was being demanded to be separate. Describe that a little bit. Definitely. um, My dad was like, he was an abuser. And so he's very big on, you know, keeping everybody separate. So there was a lot of isolation. Um, If we laugh too much or try to talk too much with each other you know we were told to be quiet or my mom would get nervous and and tell us don't not to make noise so my dad wouldn't be upset so we were always in fear that we would just like set him off and and so everybody was always like staying to themselves trying to be quiet trying not to make messes or make a noise because it wasn't going to be just like you know a yelling it was somebody was gonna get beat up right yeah. and you had talked about that even since the atmosphere was so tense when you guys, it wasn't just an argument, even when you guys were with each other, okay. it would break out into, to describe that, it would break out into violence, like right away. So definitely we had that learned violence. Um, we had a lot of anger um, as children. I remember like one of my sisters pulling a knife out and like chasing my brother up a tree. Um, it, it was just get very physical, even with the children. Um, people would get would like pull out stuff and beat each other and and it wasn't just the normal we got into like a scuffle and I, I know a lot of it was because everybody in the house was being abused all the girls all the boys my mom everybody is abused by my dad 
and physically, sexually, um, verbally, every which way. And so everybody was dealing with that. And a lot of times, and that's something I like to like pick out for people, a lot of times we're dealing with anger because it was a strong man that mm. comes in and he lies to you and tells you, I'll protect you. If you're, if you're big, if you're strong, if you're yeah. aggressive, you won't get hurt. And then we you know, carry that forward in life and we're these angry, aggressive, abusive people that we never wanted to be. Yeah, and how did your mom deal with that? Instead of trying to stop it when you guys would get violent, what would she do? My mom would, um, well, when my dad wasn't there or something, she would like try to shut it down. But sometimes she would just get to a point with violence and she would just kind of do a boxing ring thing like, okay, you guys have, you know, 10 <laughs> minutes to beat each other up right here. And then when you're done, we're all done, you know, and so they would do that. <laughs> Getting back to the poverty. When, yeah. when is the first time that you ever had a new pair of clothes? The very first time. So all my clothes were hand-me-downs. Um, you know, we definitely, or we would buy it like Goodwill or something like that. But the very first time I got to go, what I would say, like a real store and buy a brand new piece of clothing was when I was um, promoting out of sixth grade and I got to go buy a dress for the first time. What color was the dress? It was lavender with some like white lines. It was totally 80s with like puffy I'm sleeves. sure it looks so pretty. That's so <laughs> awesome. Um, so, you know, getting back to the house, when, when you guys in this atmosphere, obviously playing, you said that you guys would be able to play in the backyard, but right, right. you never have a remembrance of playing. What did you do instead? I, I wasn't like too much a player. I was like playing around because I was like mom number two. So I would be the one to take care of the kids and put people to bed or cook or clean when my mom was, let's say, indisposed. Like my dad would just, you know, take mom and we couldn't have a mom. And so I was always just read. I would read a lot. I read a lot of books um, growing up in the backyard. <laughs> yeah. How old were you when you babysat for the first time? You said about three to five kids. How old were you? Um, probably seven or eight. I think it was probably like second or third. That's grade. bottle feeding. Yes, we changing had a newborn. diapers, yes. everything. Because your parents, you said, would often just leave. Yeah, they had to go run an errand or they had to go do something, and they would just leave, and we would stay home, and then I was taking care of the household. Man, and um, you were living in a fear. You said of a word of constant abandonment. And your dad, he would say certain things that would keep reinforcing it. What are some of the threats that would be of abandonment that you'd be going through? Right. So I would say it came from both, but my dad definitely would threaten oftentimes of like isolating or like he would take some of my siblings, my, the brother and sister that were right underneath me. Oftentimes I would say like they always, I felt like they got it the worst, but he would like drop them off places like outside of an orphanage and tell them like if they didn't listen to him, like he was going to turn them into the orphanage. Um, and I know like my mom would even tell us like, you know, don't complain about dad at school. If anybody asks you anything, don't say anything or else you're going to get taken away from each other and you're never going to see each other again. So this is the beginning. This is just the beginning intro of the atmosphere of what yeah. she was growing up in. Here's number one. You guys ready? Number one. How your story began does not determine how it's going to end. How your story began does not determine how it's going to end. I don't care if you were born in a trailer park. I don't care if you were born from uh, the uh, adjunct of rape. It doesn't matter if you almost were aborted and somebody dropped you. God never drops you. God is an adopter. Right. You are in this building. However you began does not determine how you're going to end. Listen to Psalm 72, verse 12 through 14. He, being Jesus, will rescue the poor when they cry to him. He will help the oppressed who have no one to defend them. He feels pity for the weak and the needy, and he will rescue them. This is your God that you serve. He will redeem them from the oppression and the violence, for their lives are precious to him. I don't know if you were beaten. I don't know the abuse you've been through, but I want you to know your life is precious to Jesus. You're in this place because you're precious to Jesus, wherever you've come from. So many people feel like because they were born in the wrong neighborhood, right. because of the parents they had, because they were on the wrong side of the street, because of the skin color they have, they consistently are putting themselves in the place of being a slave, of being a victim. But if you are in the family of Christ, there is no slave, there is no free. 
There was no black, there was no white. There was no racial prejudice. There was no class. We are all children of God and we have an inheritance that has been given to us from Jesus. <laughs> Hallelujah. Amen, amen. amen. Woo. Okay, so let's continue. Let's talk a little bit more about the abuse here. So you said there was physical abuse and obviously this is your father. What did he do for a living? Um, primarily he was a truck driver, but my, my father was also a music minister. And so we, um, <laughs> and I would say this would be like the confusing part. Um, I grew up in church. Um, I got saved when I was five. And when I say I grew up in church, like we were like, you know, the, the guest speakers, the guest musicians, and we were always in church. We were- All the know, conferences. All the conferences. I think I, it was like eight or nine at um, Gospel Bill um, Children's. I was in the children's area and I, I received the gift of speaking in tongues. And so I definitely knew God this entire time. I remember being five years old and praying the sinner's prayer because I knew I needed a savior. I had so much fear in, my, in me already. Um, and I knew I couldn't save myself, but um, God was always there for me through everything. I think it's something I told you. It's like, if I didn't know God, I wouldn't have made it through that life. Yeah. Like, there's no way I would have been, you know, sane. I, I would feel like I would have lost my mind um, from all of the abuse. Um, yeah. But, but God, God was there. And the problem was, I love how he named this the entangling. The problem was even though I had access to all these things and I had this really great God that loved me and died for me and made a way for me, I didn't know how to access it because I had this crazy image of a father and I didn't want to go to him or bother him or upset him because then he might um, do something mean to me. And so I thought, I just got to be a good daughter and stay quiet right. and not be a bother to God. And I just got to take care of myself. And these were lies. And you may be in the room and you may be under some like religious mindset or, or some idea that, yep. you know what, God, um, you just died for my sins and I just got to be good and quiet and I got to deal with all this internal mess. But God wants to heal every tormenting thought, every brokenness, every place that you're hurting, the memories. He, he wants wants to show you who you were created to be. Um, and I think we just got to give him a chance, you know? So your dad was abusing you and your nine siblings, all nine of you. Yes. And he was a worship leader at the same time. Yes. Well, there you go. He's a minister. He would travel from, and that's the thing, because we were never stable. So we were never in like one church long. We would just go from church to church to church to church. He would just, he would be the guest and leave. Be the guest you know? and leave. So yep. no accountability yep. in his life. So in the physical abuse, for instance, you said he beat your mother quite terribly, but you had one um, story about a typewriter. Tell us about that. Oh, and so I would say I was the one who got um, beat the least. I was always trying to be quiet, take care of the babies. I was trying to be the good one all the time. And um, one time, I guess I just walked into the room at the wrong time. I think probably I heard the baby crying and was like coming in to help um, take care of the baby. And my mom and my dad, I think, must have been fighting. I can't even remember. But I remember I walked in the room, and he had a desk in his, in his room at that time. And he had a, um, those older, like, metal typewriters. And he threw it at me. I remember it hit me in the head, and that's the last thing I remember until I woke up the next morning in the closet. So I don't know if I landed there or if he put me in there. Um, but <laughs> nobody checked on me or anything. I just woke up the next and day. And nobody spoke anything about it after no. it happened. Nobody asked me how You just how walked I was. out of the closet, and Everybody acted and like, like, you know, let's go make some mac and cheese. Yep. Okay. Like life was normal. Yeah. Um, verbal abuse. You, there's a lot of name calling. We're talking demeaning phrases. Yes. Your dad actually took away your mom's driving privileges. Right when they got married, like within the first year, my mom wasn't allowed to drive anymore. So he sold her car. And he did not let her drive anymore. Um, didn't let her work anymore. He was just very, very controlling. And you guys, so you obviously couldn't drive any as well so you guys oh, walked no. everywhere we walked everywhere yeah and you said you were even attacked one time when you were walking i was attacked a couple of times when i was walking yeah um my dad refused to give us rides or anything like that and i was actually walking to work when one time i got um attacked by an assailant and i fought my way out and you know the cops came and da 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 but still he didn't offer any rides yeah your sister was the only one who actually spoke up and what happened to her 
Yeah, my sister, um, one of my sisters did speak up. She was like, the, she was the third child and um, I had spoken to my mom and had brought it up and you know she made me apologize to my dad she was just, like telling me i was wrong uh, my sister though kept being very vocal this is why she was getting a lot of physical abuse um, my sister ended up speaking at school and um, they sent some investigators my mom told everybody not to say anything or else that's what she said you're all going to get taken away and never see each other again so everybody lied to them and not that we ever talked about the abuse but we, we still said nothing's wrong and uh, my sister ended up being taken away. There was um, accusations back towards her and she was taken away um, as a danger to herself and others. Wow. And she was put on psych meds and put into group homes and she was never returned back to the family. And she wasn't taken away for the abuse. No. She was taken away as a danger to herself and others. Yeah. And um, you said this abuse, sexual abuse specifically was happening weekly. It's happening mm -hmm. to all nine of you. Yes. Um, what age did that start for you? Uh, as far back as I can recall, it's like three, three, four years old. Three years old, old yeah. all the way until when you left the house. Until I left. 17. 17. So for 14 solid years. So your dad, you said he was a very charismatic man. What did the church see in your dad this entire time? Did they even suspect anything? No, no, nobody suspected anything. Um, we were even in a Pentecostal churches and, you know, we learned all about deliverance and healing and the Holy Spirit. And we, we learned everything you're supposed to learn, but we weren't living the life you're supposed to live as a born again believer. And so just coming to church, and that's what I encourage you guys here, you know, sometimes you think I'm going to go to church and it's going to fix everything. It's not about going to church. It's literally about surrendering your life, okay, yep. and taking on yep. the life of Christ. This is true. It, it's, it is transformation, not behavior modification. God is not looking for you to be a good child, okay? He mm. wants you to love him and out of that love, then obey him. And I didn't learn that for a long time. I know we're going to get that to that later. Uh, but what God can do for your life is absolutely amazing like i should be a statistic right i should um not be who i get to be today right but it's by god's power okay because it's what god had ordained god said yes. before yes. you were born i knew you so even though all these people and circumstances and things were trying to steal or redefine or contort the image of God in me, okay, God made sure I knew who he was. And even though I took a long, mm. twisted road there, he made sure that he pulled me out of that dark place and put me in his light. So you were in church this entire time. Let me ask you about your view of God. You said something so powerful. You said, I never once blamed God. Right. Now, right. how could you do that? How could you, going to church, your dad's even a worship minister. Many people would tangle up. You know, your dad's doing this. He's also a Christian. With God must be doing this. So what, you said there was this beautiful, you said there was a hope that you had. Describe yeah. that in the midst of it all. Yeah. Um, my, my hope was that being with Jesus, you know, being in heaven with him for eternity, that he was never going to leave me, he was never going to forsake me, and that he loved me. And I knew that Jesus had already endured so much pain, so much abuse. And so I know it's probably not the, the best theological view, but I thought, like, you know, if Jesus did all that for me, like, I'm going to get through this too. Like, I'm not going to say, I went through this and God doesn't love me. Because if God did that to his own son, Jesus, then mm. I'm saying, I'm going to get through this too. And I recognized that my dad, right? Because like I said, I did learn about demons. I knew that Satan was real. I knew that there was a hell. And, right. and I knew that people have a choice. Okay, God gives all of us free will. Yes. Nobody is going to make you do anything. And so the same way my dad chose, even though he knew Jesus, to be this abuser, I said, I'm going to choose to know God, to love God, and not be that way. Okay? And so no matter what's been done to you and no matter what you've done, you have a choice because Jesus died to give it to you. Yeah. So make the right choice. Amen. Amen. So even though nobody saw through your dad and what was happening in leadership, you still have this hope in God. Number two, even when no one else seems to notice or care, mm -hmm. God sees and he always cares. Psalm 139, 1 through 3, O Lord, you have examined my heart. You know everything about me. You know when I sit down 
or when I stand up. You know my thoughts even when I'm far away. You see me when I travel and when I rest at home. You know everything I do. Genesis 16, 13. Come on. Hagar has been sent away into the desert. But God was there and Hagar said this. Therefore, Hagar used another name to refer to the Lord. She's out in the desert by herself, sees, thinks nobody sees her and her child. But then she calls him a beautiful name. You are the God who sees me. She also said, I have truly seen the one who sees me. It doesn't matter where you were. Some of you tonight are in this building. And even though you're in the midst of this crowd, you still feel alone. You feel so lonely, you feel invisible. It might have started when you were in your house. And even now, you could be in the midst of us people and still feel by yourself. I want you to know Psalm 56, verse 8. Listen to this beautiful scripture. You, O oh Jesus, keep track of all of my sorrows. You have collected all of my tears in your bottle. You have recorded each one in your book. Do you know that there's not just a book of life where your name is written so you can go to heaven? There is a book where Jesus has written every single one of your tears, the reason for them, and he keeps them in a bottle and he looks at them throughout the day. Jesus is for you. He sees you. Even if you feel abandoned, I want every person here to know. Jesus who's here tonight will never abandon you. He sees you and through this beautiful story, I hope that you're already seeing that even if nobody knew, God knew yeah, he did. and God saw. Amen. Amen. So real quick, and we're going to jump in some really awesome stuff that's about to happen here, but I just really want to go. There's a whole nother side. God, you know, you weren't losing your hope in him. God was still planting seeds. Things were working out. But there was this also this sort of dark side. That was coming against. And this is the demonic stuff that was happening in your family. This stuff is crazy. So I got to talk about it. So you said there was generational witchcraft that was in your family. Describe, for instance, what your mom was doing before she got saved. So my mom was studying um, to be a witch, like learning like spells and reading all the books. And like she was being mentored by um, some of her, I think her dad's aunts. And like she would sit in the pentagram and she was at the stage now in her training where she was going to like call the demon that was going to give her um, power. And so in my family, what they would do often is, I guess in my family line, is like it would like this demon, they would pick the next one and they would bring that one in and start to train them um, in this witchcraft. Yeah, tell me of her, her salvation story. This is crazy. They got to hear this. Yeah, I want to go kind of quick, but yeah, it's, it is a little bit crazy. And so um, my mom had this encounter in the middle of the night. And so my mom's household was abusive. My grandpa was an alcoholic. He, I think he died when I was like four. I don't remember him at all. Um, I never even seen a picture. But they would, my, my grandmother would wake her up to get all the kids out of the house. Um, because grandpa was drunk and was going to start getting wild. And so um, my mom felt somebody wake her up. She thought it was her mom. It wasn't. Nothing was there. So she kind of went back to bed. Something woke up again. She looks out and she sees like out like her door through the front window. She saw um, like this demon forming under the street light, And it was coming for her. As big as the street light. As big as the street light. And um, coming for her, she said. And all of a sudden something whispered to her and said, pray. Well, my mom grew up Catholic and had been in Catholic school, and so she only knew the rosary. She didn't know how to pray. And this thing kept getting closer and closer, and she said it was like right outside her door now to her bedroom. And, um, whoever, this, and she believes it was Jesus now was sitting next to her, and she said that he told her, um, pray the blood of Jesus. And so my mom starts, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And she said this thing just dead stops. Um, she said she was up all night praying. Kept telling her to pray. Kept telling and her, it, keep praying, keep praying. Even when she wanted to fall asleep, it would wake her up, keep praying. And she prayed all morning until it broke. Well, it breaks, it leaves, it's morning now. And um, her best friend shows up. And her best friend came over to visit her that day and told her, Christy and I have something to talk to you about. And if you can't receive this, we can't be friends. And she's like, what is it? I need to tell you about Jesus and the blood of Jesus. And my mom was like, I want it. What's the um, blood of Jesus? Exactly. Yeah. That's how she got saved. 
<laughs> you know, and it, that was something that like, my, you know, was just wild. And this is a thing that I want to remind you guys. My mom had this encounter with God. God came after her radically. And I know my parents were called by God. Okay. But again, it goes back to your choice. God tells us that he sets in front of us life and death, blessing or curse, right? Yep. But you've got to choose life. And so I know that my parents ended up walking away from that and not choosing life. They were choosing death. Okay, yep. and sin, and those things gained ac um, access back into my parents' life. And the Bible tells us that is that when something's cast out of your life, right? What does it want to do? It wants to find its way back in. And I'm going to let you know, especially parents, it doesn't just want you; it wants your generations. Okay, and so that was something that came back after me and um, my whole life. I mean, I know I had an encounter. Right. And um, just to fast forward, though, I know we're probably going to run out of time, so I'm going to hurry. Um, my entire Entire childhood growing up, just a lot of like, I would just say, like, I told him it was almost like this poltergeist, you know, just paranormal apparitions, things showing up, things moving. Like, it was just nonstop my whole life. And yep. fast forwarding, like, even into like high school and, and uh, my, my young adult years, you know, um, yep. just witches, Satanists befriending me, trying to recruit me, trying to recruit to me. you constantly, people yeah. who are in that, trying to recruit you everywhere that you went. But when was the moment that stopped? And when I look back and I said, when did all these kind of people stop trying to be my friends, you know? And it's like when I first started coming to the Way World Outreach. And it's so important to start. I didn't have, you know, godly community. I didn't have any mentorship, leadership mm -hmm. in my life at all before the Way. And so when I came to the way, it really was coming into this godly, holy, pure community. And they loved, right? And they fought for me. Um, and I didn't just come in so willingly and, and, and yay, let's go. But they continued to stand and fight and believe. And, and I thank the entire Way World Outreach Church. Um, I don't know where I'd be if it wasn't for this church um, and, and the leadership, Pastor Marco and Pastor Lisa, um, who have given their lives to just be amazing mentors and leaders over the house and to create the culture that we have. Uh, but I think you have more questions. Sorry, I can keep talking. I got <laughs> no, stuff. No, no, it's good. Number three, the devil's authority to influence your life ends the moment you become fully sold out to God. Yeah. All vacancy is occupied with Jesus. So Psalm 91, we know that chapter, we all want to quote it, but please understand the first sentence is who the promises are for. He who dwells in the secret place, not he who visits, not he who every once in a while wants to pray, not he who every once in a while wants to come to church. No. The promises that are in that chapter, a thousand will fall at your left, 10,000 at your right, but it won't come near you. Who's that for? Dwellers, not visitors. Come it on. said that the pestilence won't touch you. Dwellers, not visitors. When you get 100% sold out to Jesus, that Satan's authority will end. Praise God. And, and I'm know, so proud I'm part of a church. Are you excited to be part of a church <laughs> that on. is fully all about being sold out for Jesus? Okay. And I wanted to say yeah, this. Yeah, yeah. I wanted to say one more thing too about that is like, um, you know, in coming here, like I said, it didn't happen immediately and right away. Um, don't be discouraged, okay? Oh, I got saved and these things didn't end. But what happened here, and I think this is one of my greatest victories, is I remained. Okay, that first service I went to, um, I, my mom actually asked me to bring her. She got invited by one of my old employees, and I yep. brought her out here, right? Um, I was just getting off a graveyard shift. I drove her out to the way. Um, they had just got their building on 4th Street, okay? And so I guess they told all their members. I don't know, Pastor Lisa, is that what you guys did? Told all your members, bring people to the church and invite everybody you can because um, my friend Lisa invited my mom, who asked me to give her a ride because to this day, my mom doesn't drive. Yeah. And so so you had I, a condition, though. If you would take her only in this condition, what's that I condition? I said, as soon as I go to the altar call, we are leaving. We're out of here. I don't want to get caught up in this church. Let's go. And, um, you know, that we came to the way. And I'm in the service. Uh, I, I was telling him, too. I walked into the church. They were all trying to hug you and, and, and right. high five. You had a and reaction. Stuff. And I literally had so much fear come on me. Like, I was overwhelmed. Like, I wanted to just, like, hold myself. And I think I was, like, embracing myself. Like, don't. And I told the people, don't touch me. Don't touch me. Don't touch me. 
Um, and so they probably thought she's like on something and I wasn't, I was sober, you know, um, but I came in and to the church and with everybody else and where maybe everybody had shopping carts and, and where there was a bunch of homeless people and they looked like needy. I, and I was like, now I'm working and providing and I, and I've got all, I got my car and my clothes and my stuff. Now I can go shopping. I was broke down on the inside. Okay. And so I walked into this atmosphere. I'm totally not wanting to receive it. I'm literally like pushing the love of work away from me, right, saying, right. no, get away, uh, but I'm in the service, and God, literally, it's like I saw the hand of God, I'm like, at the right by the back door, I don't know where my mom sat, but I'm like, by the doors, ready to leave, and um, I see mm. the hand of God, like, point down the aisle, and he said, stay here, this man is going to help you. And who was that man? Pastor Marco. Pastor Marco, yeah. Pastor Marco, okay, so we're skipping ahead to a few things, there's a lot of incredible stuff that happened today, but just for the sake of time, so... Pastor Marco, you said you needed it. So at this time, you meet this incredibly handsome, incredible man. After a string <laughs> well, of terrible relationships, <laughs> all abusive boyfriends there. I mean, we can't talk about that, but we're talking about some yeah. of these boyfriends, for instance, <laughs> were coming after you. You had to get yes. teams to protect you, all this stuff. Yeah. So you're meeting this incredible man. Who is that man? Pastor Armando. Pastor but he wasn't, Armando. But, I but, want to clarify. He wasn't, he wasn't Pastor Mondo when I met him, okay? No, 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 no. So when I, fact, when I came to the way, we were living together in sin, okay? Oh, yeah. Boo, right? He wasn't the Pastor Armando. And right it was coming to church that started to convict me that I started saying, like I said, you've got to do the work, right? And so I remember saying, I gotta, we got to live right or I got to leave, right? Leaving wasn't hard for me, so I'm like, I got to go. So I left, but... Um, I had just made this decision. I love how he pointed out dwelling because I said, I'm going to stay in this place because God told me to stay here. And if that means I got to separate from sin, separate from somebody I love because we're not doing it God's way. I, you know, God just gave me Matthew 6, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and then he'll take care of all those things. And I said, God, I'm going to put you first. Um, and it paid off big time. So you're in the church. You're going to services still this entire time, falling asleep him. a lot of the time. Oh, well, the initially, <laughs> I'll say this. So when I'm first coming, right, I work graveyards. I'm falling asleep. I was like hard to stay awake because I was working, you know, 10 hours right. in Riverside and driving out to San Bernardino and then trying to drive home. And I would just keep coming. Like I was not connecting, but I was hearing the message. Um, I made the decision to end my relationship, move out on my own. And so now I'm with my daughter on my own and I still keep trying to come to the way. And I'm trying to fast forward to sum it up because I want to talk about Pastor Mondo, but it was like a year later <laughs> after I put God first, right? Um, a year later, he comes back around. And he had gone to some other church and he had asked him, like, what do I got to do like to be a husband and do this? He had never seen it, okay? He had only seen brokenness in yeah. his life. And because I made a choice to get planted in community and to live God's standard and not compromise, okay? God did the work in him separate right. while God was doing work in me, okay? And so now by this time, I'm still not like all washed clean and all good to go. But now we're like three years into it. Pastor Armando starts coming with me. We get engaged and we said, we're going to do it 100% God's way. I got to say something just real quick. All. I got to say oh, something real sorry. quick. It's really important because... If you'll know Armando and Christy, they are over the marriage ministry here at the yes. church. So this is what's incredible. This is what's awesome. I had to say this. It's you went home after having a vision. You're all convicted and like, right. we got to get together. We got to get married. And he says what to you? Oh, he says, I told him we have to get married and do it right or else I'm going to have to leave. He said, go, I'll never marry you. Because I don't believe in marriage. Yeah, he's not about it. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just awesome. Okay. So... <laughs> I'm just going to say. I love Jesus. I love Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> Woo. Okay, so Mondo came back in. Everything. Now, you're, it's your church supposedly, but all yes, of a sudden Armando church. gets on fire. And what's Armando doing? You're coming to church, but what's he start doing? So, like I said, I'm just coming into church. I'm um, just sitting there doing my notes, trying to stay awake. Pastor Armando, well, Armando comes in and everybody, like, loves him. Everybody sees him. No, I had no friends in the church still three years into it. They even told him, like, who invited you? And he said, my girlfriend, Christy. And they go, who's that? He had to, like, point me out. They go, I've never seen her. How long has she been coming? And he's all three years. And so 
it was like that bad, okay? Um, and so, because I would like run in, run out, I wouldn't make eye contact, I wouldn't talk to anybody. Uh, and so he's all popular. Um, we get, we do all the classes. Um, we get married. The only class we didn't do, come on, was leading at the way. Because I told him I'll never be a leader at the way. <laughs> <laughs> But, I love Jesus. But this is the power of what God does. See, I had seen so much bad leadership in the church in my life. I had something against the church. And I remember Pastor Marco confronting me on that. And I went home to pray about it. And um, when I went home to pray about it, God gave me this revelation. You need to forgive every leader in every church that didn't see through your dad. And I was like, right. whoa. And pastor's like, I would have never thought of that. That's, that's the Lord for sure. And in repenting there, now it gave me access to step into this role of leadership that God had ordained for my life that the enemy was trying to steal from me. You know? And yes. if I hadn't chosen to live a holy life and put God first, I wouldn't have been able to now step into the role of a wife and have this husband that's an amazing man of God. Right. Okay? And so you think doing it your way, it, it, you're going to figure it all out and you're going to get all the bells and whistles? That's a lie. Do it God's way. He has the best things for you. Worship Even when team, you don't feel like it. If the worship like team will come out, please. <laughs> worship team will come out. I just want to um, just in on this part right here. So... There were actually not one deliverance you went through, Christy. Mm -mm. There were three that you told me about. First yeah. one, you're in the service. You actually feel convicted by what Pastor uh, Marco was preaching. You asked to come up. He lays hands on you. You have incredible experience mm -hmm. getting delivered of something. You talked about it as an experience where you felt that something took over. You had no control. It was right. binding you like chains, but it was mm -hmm. broken. But then a second deliverance happens. You come to your first women's conference. Oh, no. Go ahead. I'll, I'll clarify that. But yes, those things happen. Sorry. So um, the first year is at the way, you know, and I'm hearing, like I said, Pastor Marcos is preaching everything I need to hear. But my friend invites me to go to a Joyce Myers conference. And when I go, and for the longest, I would tell people, um, they would say to me, you know what? You just need to forgive your dad. You need to forgive your dad. You forgive your mom. You need to let this go and move forward. And I would quote scriptures like God said that it's worse for, you know, how um, God said that, it, that woe to those who uh, mistreat my children. Like it's going to be worse for them than those from Sodom and Gomorrah, right? And so I would just say God's going to deal with him. And um, somebody said, no, you, you are going to be forgiven the way God forgives. I said, no, God's going to have to figure that out when I get to heaven because I'm not forgiving him. And I was like, the audacity of my unforgiveness, right? God has to figure it out? No, I needed to figure it out. I had it wrong. And so I'm at this Joyce Myers conference, and she's talking about the sexual abuse, right? The poverty, right? The, uh, everything she went through with her own father, just right. like I did. And I was like, what? Joyce Myers. And she yes. talked about this powerful move of forgiveness that God called her to. And then at the end, she asked everybody to stand up in the Long Beach, you know, convention center. Yep. And I stand up with all these other people. You know, nobody laid hands on me. Nobody came up and talked to me personally. But I heard the message of forgiveness. And I knew, like, I need to do this finally. I stood up. I prayed the prayer with them. And I told them, I literally felt at the end of that prayer like I could fly. Like I was going to float away. And the reason why she felt she was going to float away is because, put that picture up of the two people bound together. When you are in unforgiveness, you actually are carrying that person with you wherever you go. There is a weight that is on you. And even though that person, for some of you, might be dead, they actually are still with you. The people who abuse us are corpses that are on our backs even if we have no contact with them, until we release ourselves through forgiveness. Here's the last point. Everybody stay seated. If you could stand up with me, Christy. God turns your chains into your ministry. Genesis 50, verse 20. We know the story of Joseph. He's betrayed by his brothers. But all this happens. He gets promoted 14 years. He goes through of all kinds of pits and jail cells and everything happening, but he gets promoted to one of the highest places. And his brothers are all standing in front of him. They're all on their knees. And after he reveals himself, he said these words, you intended to harm me, but God intended it all for good. He brought me to this position so that I could save many lives of many people. Listen to this chapter, listen to this verse. And then healing's about to break out right now. Psalm 18, verse 15 through 19, here it is. At your command, O Lord, at the blast of your breath, 
the bottom of the sea could be seen and the foundations of the earth were laid bare. You reached down from heaven and you rescued me. You drew me out of deep waters. You rescued me from my powerful enemies, from those who hated me, who were too strong for me. They attacked me at a moment when I was in distress, but the Lord supported me. He led me to a place of safety and he rescued me because he delights in me. Who in here has a story? that Jesus took you out of where you were, deep waters, deep place. Nobody but Jesus could have rescued you. Nobody but Jesus could have seen you. Nobody but Jesus could get the glory for your story. Only God. Even though Satan meant it for your harm, God is now using your chains and making it into a ministry. Hallelujah! Every person, close your eyes please, every person. Eyes closed. This is a powerful moment. God takes your chains. And once you surrender them to the Lord, He will break them. And you will have your ministry. The same people that are going through something you went through, they need you. They need you to be free. You need to be free, not just for yourself but because there are others who are going through what you have been through and they have no hope. They need somebody to be free and tell them that you made it through. Right now, across this room, right now, I'm going to ask this question. And I saw the Lord tell me about this moment. This is what this moment and everything we've said has led up to this, this time right here. I want to pray specifically for people who feel I still have that abuser on my back. During this forgiveness series, many people have experienced freedom, but I believe specifically tonight, if you have been physically, sexually, or verbally abused, right now is your moment. You are going to disconnect and become fully untangled from whoever this person is. I don't know if they're alive. I don't know if they're dead. But if you say right now, I'm ready to become untangled, Myself and Christy are about to pray for you right now. Stand to your feet right now if you say, I want to fully be untangled. Right now, I'm seeing you stand. Do not wait. Do not wait. This is not about anybody else. This is about you and God. Stand right where you're at. Every person. Once you stand, I need you to lift your hands just like this. Put your hands out that you're about to receive something. Every person, just be quiet right now in the presence of God. As the Lord wants to begin to touch people. Christy is about to begin to pray for you to be released. But God is already moving right now in the name of Jesus. As you have stood, I am disconnecting the authority of that corpse, that person, the memories, the ideas, the violation. And I'm going to pray right after Christy prays and we're going to sever it in the name of Jesus. Begin to receive right now. Heavenly Father God, we just come before you right now. Lord, we come boldly before your throne. We don't come with guilt or shame. We don't come before you timidly, but we come with you right now boldly knowing that you have the power to set us free. So I bind up right now in the mighty name of Jesus every tormenting spirit, every demonic voice of accusation, what has had them by the throat, that has kept them stuck in places they didn't believe long and I command it right now to be broken off of them in the name of Jesus. Jesus They are the temple of the living God. You indwell them Lord Jesus and nothing has right to them. We relinquish right now every bit of unforgiveness that we have held in our hearts. We command tormenting thoughts and those demonic mindsets to cease and desist. God we receive right now the peace of God in our souls I thank you, Father, you are releasing sound sleep, that you are right now resisting everything that tells them they can't be free. Jesus, you died for their freedom. You made a way for it. And Lord, you said that by your stripes, they would be healed. So heal them emotionally. Heal them mentally, Lord. Heal them right now. The wounds of their soul, Lord, that you are the only one who can touch and heal. And we thank you that your voice is going to
going to echo in them and not the negative voices. Lord, we uproot those plantings right now and we just declare the word of the Lord over them that they will live, that they will prosper, Lord, that they are beloved and chosen. God, thank you today for setting them free, for encountering them in this place the way you did me. Lord, I pray right now that you restore back to them, like Joel 2 says, the years the locusts have eaten. God, everywhere they thought, Lord, I lost this. I, didn't, I don't have that. It was taken from me and I can't get it back. They can't, but you can. Give them back their purity and their innocence, their sanity, Lord, and their joy. Give back their purpose, Lord. Let them hold it tight in the palm of their hand. Today, Lord, they choose life. Thank now you, Now begin Jesus. to receive right now. Just stand right there. Focus on Jesus. She's beginning to break this right now through that prayer. Things are beginning to break. Now you need to receive. Just begin to receive right now. You're gonna, God is approaching many of you. The face of Jesus is in front of you. You need to take that memory. You need to take those pains and emotions right now. Hand them over to Jesus. That prayer just broke the, the power and authority of the bondage. Now I need you to hand it over to Jesus. Give it over to the Lord. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus. Thank you, God. Here it goes. Here it goes. Many of you right now, I see you being delivered. You're being set free. Just receive that right now. Receive that right now. Thank you, Lord. All over this building. That's it. Just give it to the Lord. He loves you. He's here for you right now. This is the night to be untangled. This is the night to be untangled. Don't take this home ever again. Leave it right now. Thank you, Jesus. We let it go. We surrender it to you. I see the cross. I see the blood of Jesus. I see what you did, God. All my pain is in your hands. Now, I want you to forgive these people right now. Completely forgive and let them go. You need to say in your heart, I forgive them, Lord, and I let them go. I forgive them, Lord, and I let them go. It doesn't matter if they ever apologize. It doesn't matter if you ever. It doesn't matter. Your freedom is what matters to God right now. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Every person. Such a beautiful presence right now. The anointing of God. All the way in the back, sir. You're getting it all the way in the back. It's touching you. I don't know everything you've been through, sir, with that big P on your shirt. But God has seen you. Thank you for coming tonight. Thank you for coming. This lady right here with the Dodgers, blue Dodgers shirt on, just right here. God is literally delivering you, setting you free. He loves you tonight. In this moment, with every person right now, focus on Jesus. Do you know him? Do you know him as your savior? Do you know Jesus as the Lord of your life? If something, God forbid, happened to you tonight, would you know that you would wake up in front of Jesus for eternity? If you say, Gavin, I have no idea. I do not have peace with God. You cannot buy peace with God. There's not enough money to buy it. Only Jesus and his son accepting his sacrifice can do it for you. If you say, Gavin, I do not know Jesus, but I want to know Jesus tonight. I want to have peace with God. Then I want you very quickly as the altar team comes up to walk up to the front right now. You say, that's me. I want peace with God. Then walk up to the front. You don't need to wait one more moment. Everybody give them a hand for all the people that are coming right now. I want peace with God. This is your moment. Walk up. Is there anybody tonight? Thank you. Thank you, sir. Anybody tonight? I want peace with God. Thank you. Thank you. Give them a hand as they're coming up right now. I want peace with God. Thank you, Jesus. Everybody, thank you. He's coming up tonight. Look at this. Look at these people coming from the back. This is your moment right now. I want peace with God. Thank you, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Come on, give him a hand like you care about him. Like it's your sister. Like it's your brother. Like it's your mom. Like it's your dad. Come on. We're the family of God. We care about these people. We care about these people. These are new family members. Right now, I'm going to lead you in a very simple prayer. 
I'm going to lead you in a really simple prayer, and then the, the team is going to follow up with you. They're going to make sure you're ready for your next steps, getting baptized if you haven't been baptized. We have amazing discipleship classes here as well, but let's all pray this prayer right now. Say, Dear Lord Jesus, come on out loud, everybody. Dear Lord Jesus, I give you my life. I turn over my agenda. I turn over my will. Take control of my life. I repent of my sins, and I thank you that your blood washed me clean. Thank you for dying and thank you for coming back to life so that I could be saved. I'm no longer the devils, but I belong to you, Jesus. I don't belong to the world, but I belong to you, Jesus. And I am dedicating to be a disciple. I'm not just gonna say this prayer. I'm going to become a disciple. Thank you, Jesus for saving me. Everybody give him a hand right now. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. This Sunday, we have Pastor Marco, who's going to be back this Sunday preaching. And we also are going to be starting our growth challenge, please. We're excited about fasting with you. We're excited about going through the word. Thank you all for coming tonight. What an incredible time. Let's thank Miss Christy again. Let's give her a hand for Miss Christy. Amazing story. Amazing that. God bless you guys.